All right, looks like we are live. Thank you. Wonderful, looks like folks are joining us. So this is great. And translation. Uh, for those of you who are arriving, uh, just a quick hello. Uh, we're going to give a few minutes for guests to log in, uh, and then we'll officially get started. Uh, for those who are joining us and for our panel, I've started the interpretation. So if you would like to make your uh, language choice, Feel free to do so now. Yes, I can hear you. And again, for those who have just joined us, thank you for joining. Uh, we're gonna give uh, everyone just a few minutes to get logged in. We're just at six o'clock. We um, will be starting momentarily. We really wanna be respectful of everyone's time, but we also wanna make sure that folks have an opportunity to get signed in. So thank you for your patience and we'll be just a, a few moments before we get started. Thank you. We're getting started in just a few seconds. Thank you all for your, your patience while we wait for folks to join us. Well, it's about two minutes after. Um, I want to go ahead and get started and really would just like to thank you all for joining us. Um, my name is Eugene Howard. I am a senior city planner with the city and county of Denver uh, and really just want to welcome you all and thank you for taking time out of your schedules to join us on this really important conversation on understanding displacement. Um, I want to let you all know that we do have interpretation available. I'm going to pause for a second and let Andrea make that announcement to anyone who needs it. She's muted. 
Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Andrea Saika, and I am here with the Community Language Cooperative. Today, we will we'll be creating a space of language justice. That means that everybody has the opportunity to speak in the language of their heart or the language they feel more comfortable in. Today, we will provide simultaneous interpretation in English and Spanish. And if you are hearing this, it means that you already chose um, a channel. For those that can hear me and are able to write in the chat, please let everyone else know that they need to select a channel. I am going to say this in Spanish now in the Spanish language. So please give me a minute. All right, I think Andrea has given her instructions. And I would like to then go ahead and just, uh, again, thank you all for uh, joining us this evening. We really hope at the City and County of Denver that this will be the first of many conversations on important topics that are uh, important to our city and important to our residents. Uh, we thank you for joining us in this really important conversation. We really hope that uh, you will create some space and some grace for us. Uh, for many of us, these are really challenging uh, topics and particularly a challenging time. Um, moderating tonight's conversation is Renee Martinez Stone of the West Denver Renaissance Collaborative. Renee is the executive director of WDRC and has been working in the West Denver neighborhoods for several years now, advocating for and elevating the needs of residents in the area. Renee is not only the executive director of WDRC, she is also an architect, a planner, and a Denver native. So as a part of tonight's discussion, we will be taking questions from you, the audience. We would like to give priority to West Denver residents, people of color, and those who have experienced displacement firsthand. So if that is you and you feel comfortable doing so, please let us know in the questions and answers section uh, and we will make sure to look for your questions uh, to allow you to ask them. We will also be taking questions from anyone who has uh, dialed in only uh, using a telephone. Uh, and so we will uh, be going to the question and answers um, midway through tonight's presentation. Uh, but to get us started, I would like to turn things over to Renee Martinez Stone and, and thank you. Thank you all for joining us, Renee. Thank you, Eugene. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, it's a privilege to be your moderator tonight on this important topic. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank the City and County of Denver and Community Planning and Development. We're here tonight focused on this discussion um, because the NPI West team, led by Eugene, um, has responded to requests to dive deeper on this topic of gentrification and displacement. So it is a direct response and <clears throat> I hope it'll be the first of many. Um, tonight, I will be introducing some key topics so that we understand some issues um, the same. Then I'll be asking some question of our panelists. And then of course, we'll be opening it up as, Jean, as Eugene described. So you'll be putting your questions in the chat box indicating if you are a West Denver resident, so we can focus on you um, if you're in an impacted neighborhood, and then we'll be switching to phones. The rules are listed here. Of course, everyone is welcome. Um, we, you know, we wanna keep questions brief. We wanna not dive too deeply on subjects tonight. So I think one of the things I wanna emphasize is that we're forgiving. This is a difficult subject um, in some cases, it's new to everyone. And I know, speaking for myself, there are times that I misspeak or I say something wrong, and we need to be forgiving of one another as we dive into this topic and really try and learn more about it. Um, I guess I'll also ask your forgiveness because I will be pushing us along, and at times it may feel like I'm cutting a certain conversation short, but that's because we really need to touch on some topics that 
have been identified as really important. So be respectful of one another and let's, let's go ahead and move on tonight. All right, we have some great panelists here tonight uh, with a lot of depth of expertise. Certainly they're not the only ones knowledgeable or working on this topic. There's actually many panelists who are doing great work to minimize displacement throughout the city. So uh, I'm gonna quickly for our participants on the phone, run through who's our panelists. We have Laura Aldrete. Laura is a born and raised in Denver. She's one of our fluent Spanish speakers tonight. She's the director of the Com community planning and development. And throughout her career, she's focused on bridging both public and private, the public and private sectors. She understands the importance of public engagement to creating quality-driven plans. Next, we have Councilwoman Torres. She's our District 3 Councilwoman, and she is a third-generation Denverite who's lived in the Villa Park neighborhood, is, who is one of our West Denver neighborhoods for over 30 years. She's worked for the city and is a seasoned advocate for the services and amenities that impact quality of life and equity. Thank you, Councilwoman Torres, for being here. We have Tiana Patterson. In 2019, just recently, Tiana was named one of the rising stars in housing by Denverite Magazine. So we're really happy to have her. She's the public partnership and legal director at the Elevation Community Land Trust here in Colorado. We have Carrie Makarowitz. Carrie is an associate professor at the University of Colorado, Denver. Her current work is focused on community and economic development and the impacts of these systems on human well being. Thanks, Carrie, for being here. And last but not least, we have Katie McKenna, who is a senior planner director at the Enterprise Community Partners. It's a national nonprofit focused on affordable housing. And at Enterprise, Katie leads work to advance racial equity through community development and affordable housing programs. So we work with her in West Denver and we're proud to have her here tonight. All right, with that, I am going to get started on some of the, the groundwork. This map shows um, the West Denver neighborhoods. The West Denver Renaissance Collaborative is an initiative of the city and county of Denver, the Denver Housing Authority and nonprofits. We work on West Denver issues with guidance from some very committed community leaders who I know were on this call tonight. They're from our neighborhoods. They are doing the hard work and we're supporting and advocating that work. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. There's about 25,000 households in those nine neighborhoods and about 70,000 residents. So to get us all on the same page, I really wanted to define gentrification. And is this a simplification? It absolutely is because we don't wanna be here till midnight, but I wanted to get us launched. So gentrification is a process of change. It's really about economic change. It, 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 real estate is a part of that. Um, sometimes gentrification is welcomed. It's initial change that where there hasn't been investment um, until those changes start to result in rising rents, rising housing costs, and they begin to result in displacement of existing residents, um, creating a loss of the diversity that's in the neighborhood, culture, the social support systems that are there, and even some of the services that have been serving those residents for a long time. That's where the link is between gentrification and involuntary displacement or voluntary displacement. Um, so you see, uh, there's a map that the city published that identified areas that were vulnerable to gentrification. I believe that was a couple of years ago. And then listed there is um, factors that indicate displacement is occurring. So those are rising home values, rent, and rather than get into those specifically, let's go to the next slide and let's bring it home. Let's bring it to West Denver. West Denver is experiencing significant displacement right now. So um, what you see um, is a chart there that shows that between 2007 and 2019, property taxes increased from $730 annual, annually to 1800. What will be a little more relatable is that housing values went from 100,000 to 360,000 
and rent for a lot of our renter households went from about $780 a month in 2007 to $2,600. That's more than three times of an increase in that time frame. In this area where homeowners have been able to achieve the American dream of home ownership, um, those low income homeowners, which are twice as many as the city and county of Denver, are now going down. So we're losing those, those households. Um, and you can see in the slide there, the slides indicate that between 2015 and 2018, almost 4,000 households, 3,900 households were displaced with 5,800 kids. Um, that's a significant loss and change to West Denver. There's a map that shows little dots. Those dots are households and where they went when they left West Denver. So these are real families facing insurmountable housing price increases in rent or in property taxes that they cannot keep up with. Their kids losing their homes and access to their schools. Um, and, and many of the families we understand are trying to keep a footing. They're trying to stay close to their neighborhood. So you can see where we've circled a lot of those dots, to those households to the south. We know that they are trying to keep a hold on their neighborhood. Overall, our studies, and this is from um, some providers that look at data very frequently, there's 20,000 households in the nine neighborhoods that are vulnerable or experiencing gentrification. So it's very real. I'm really happy to hear, to see some participants from these neighborhoods that will talk about this change that they're experiencing. Next. And this isn't just happening in West Denver. Um, Denver is a hot spot and there is pressure throughout in many other neighborhoods other than West Denver. And this isn't just normal change. What's happening in Denver is, um, this is an article from this year. Um, Denver was number two in the country just behind San Francisco in gentrification after looking at a number of neighborhoods that were experiencing change. And there've been other studies, um, we'll be happy to list these when we um, send out answers to questions where, you know, if in one study, Denver was ranked number one in the loss of Hus Hispanic and Latino households. So there's a lot of change. It's very rapid. It's not typical. So when people say, ah, neighborhood change happens, it happens all the time. This is not a, this is not typical change and it's being recognized nationally. And we're really happy to welcome all the partners here. So what do we do? This slide here is one slide, but it really encapsulates a lot of things that are being done um, among, with the city, nonprofits, other partners to try and mitigate displacement. So I'm going to highlight a few of them. I'm not going to go through them in detail. The panelists will be able to talk about some of these solutions um, in the questions that I have and that you will have for them, but I'll, I'll just hit on a few. Um, supportive services. This is existing services, tried and true housing counseling services that have been around, as well as new services, you know, TRUA and legal services. Um, but what's most important is that we're focusing on community outreach and investing in our local leaders who are knowledgeable to connect households who need these services to um, directly to them and supporting them through language and reassurance and trust um, to access those services. Next is equity. Now we have the Nest Department of the City who is really doing this important work that we know from nation, nationwide um, cities experiencing displacement. We have to focus on equity. We have to understand where there's inequity and we need to really know where there's not equitable access to tools and resources. So things that we might think, hey, everybody can use, everybody can reach, that's not necessarily true. And we're taking the time and steps to figure out where those barriers exist. Um, next, I'll highlight just that we need to preserve housing and that we need to build housing. The city and the, the city and county of Denver and the Denver Housing Authority and many others are focused on building new housing. We need to support that housing. Um, it's affordable, it's accessible, and it'll have meaningful impacts. And in addition, this development, I know that DHA, as they redevelop, is focusing on 
how do we have best practices in terms of development without displacement? What are we doing to, um, to minimize and to work with the community um, in, in the neighborhoods in which these investments exist? There's also new programs. So you'll see on this list, the stay in place program is a new land trust partnership with the Elevation Community Land Trust and WDRC, where we're helping to, to um, leverage owner equity to help them stay in their home or to leverage that equity to build an ADU that grows their home equity. And then I will highlight community benefits agreements is another way to identify meaningful long-term needs that need to be incorporated into large scale projects. Those are the community um, members who understand the needs and have seen the impacts and are strong partners in creating um, development without displacement. And last, before we open to our first question, is really policy. The ability of local residents to identify what their neighborhoods need and how policy can help to achieve those needs. So with that, I'll, I'll emphasize local action is critical for neighborhoods experiencing or vulnerable to involuntary displacement. And we'll go to our first question for our, our panel. So um, this is a map here that shows, it's referred to as a red line map in 1938, and then a 2016-2017 vulnerable neighborhoods map. Um, identifying, you see in red um, and in purple, a lot of the same neighborhoods. Um, neighborhoods experiencing involuntary displacement are impacted by systems, inequity, and racism. So my first question is, what, to the panel, um, what makes some neighborhoods more vulnerable to displacement than others? Um, and Katie, um, do you want to start on this one? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Renee. Um, I think that's a really great place to start. How did we get here in the first place? Um, especially because I think understanding the systemic racism that got us here is a key to helping us chart a different path forward for West Denver and for the rest of the city. Um, so some of the critical factors that are at play in the displacement puzzle are wealth and segregation and land use. And I'll make sure to talk about all three and how they connect. Um, but first, maybe a, a look back in history would be helpful. Um, so honestly, we could look all the way back to 1619. But for today, let's just go back to the 1930s. Um, as part of the New Deal, a federal effort to bring the U.S. out of the Great Depression, there was an effort to increase home ownership launched, and the federal government decided to back private mortgage loans. Like other lenders, the government um, wanted to mitigate risk, and unfortunately, they did so primarily on the basis of race. So 80 years ago, a federal agency, it's called the Homeowners Loan Corporation, uh, created the residential security map. That's the map that's up on the screen. Um, and neighborhoods that were considered high risk or hazardous, these were, these are the red neighborhoods that you see on the screen, a lot of West Denver. Um, these are neighborhoods where uh, people who are not white lived and owned businesses. They, uh, they were often called redlined as a shorthand. Um, so lending institutions in these areas uh, denied access to capital investment, which could improve housing conditions and economic conditions in these communities. Um, and this investment is also tied directly to a key way that Americans build wealth. And so there's a direct connection back to the racial wealth gap that is incredibly persistent in the U.S. today. So while overt redlining is illegal today, it's prohibited under the Fair Housing Act of 1968, there are some enduring effects um, and it's still evident in Denver and throughout the country um, and West Denver specifically. I think that's a lot of what the conversation tonight, um, why we are here to talk about this. Um, so to get back to some of the factors that I was mentioning before, um, redlining really buttressed the segregated structure of our cities. Um, so most of the neighborhoods, 74% uh, actually that were redlined in the 1930s are low to moderate income neighborhoods today. And most of the red line neighborhoods of the past are still minority in mi minority neighborhoods today. So we're, we still have a segregated neighborhood system. Um, 
now since uh, since it's election season, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty to answer a little bit of a different question that uh, than what Renee asked. Um, so, what improves neighborhood stability? And I think this is important an important question for us to answer. And I'll be brief um, so that we don't continue to repeat the patterns that have caused involuntary displacement in the past. So some of the factors that I believe can increase neighborhood stability are community cohesion, when neighbors know each other and are connected socially and through schools and other institutions and are intentionally organized, they're really well positioned to identify and respond to opportunities and threats. Um, and so community led organizations are a key component of stability. Housing affordability is another key component. Um, so if folks can generally afford the housing in their community, they have the power of choice. And we know that the market does not deliver equitable housing. Um, and on top of that, we also know that the racial wealth divide was, which was solidified by redlining um, also persists. Um, so that means we need to invest in affordable rental and home ownership options. We need to invest dollars. Um, that's pretty obvious. Um, but we also need to invest as a city and as a community by supporting policies that increase affordability. So these policies often face pretty strong opposition from residents. So if you were one of the folks um, who asked in advance uh, what you personally can do, here are some ideas. So uh, right. some of the, to... go ahead, Renee. Um, we have to move on to the next question. Great. So so um, we will hit some of those ideas um, in additional questions. Um, but speaking of that divide, um, a lot of that divide means that some of those neighborhoods are underinvested. Um, and many of the West Denver neighborhoods have been historically in terms of infrastructure and other investments. And unfortunately, those investments can lead to the very change that we're talking about, the change that fuels gentrification. Um, how do we balance market development pressure with the need to keep neighborhoods affordable for the people who've lived there for decades? And Councilwoman Torres, I'm gonna to toss this to you. And, yeah, there you go. Thank you. There we go. Thank you, Renee. Um, so it's um, a, a pretty deep question. Um, what I what I would say initially is that investments in West Denver, um, I, I think we we often think about them um, and read about them coming as a result of gentrification. Um, in, in West Denver, what we definitely saw was that they also came through some really deliberate community activism. Um, and those were uh, things like infrastructure improvements like paving alleys, um, but then also community amenities um, and health amenities like parks um, and recreation centers and bike lanes. Um, these were communities that always wanted safer streets, better schools, better recreation options. Um, but I remember that um, there was a time when my predecessor, um, now Clerk Lopez, rented a van and brought city department leaders on a tour of the district to areas they'd never seen before or been to before. Some of them didn't realize Denver extended as far west as it does. They just hadn't been that far um, through the city. And you have to experience these neighborhoods to understand some of the work that needs to be done. Um, when he moved his, his office to Morrison Road, um, he forced uh, the expansion of um, cable uh, wiring. Um, there was no cabling in, uh, in Westwood at that time. And so in order to set up his office, um, Comcast had to come out and uh, lay cable in that, uh, in that neighborhood. It didn't have it before then. I mean, you know, there's, there's stuff like that, that, that is constantly getting pushed and pushed um, by uh, presence and uh, by really forcing the question. Um, as we start to hear and respond to communities who've been marginalized, um, and make attempts to address historic inequities, some things are required um, and that we recognize that neighborhood improvements inevitably will lead to increased costs, rents, some property taxes, and competition from the outside the neighborhood wanting um, housing. Uh, so what we look at in terms of um, uh, safeguards or almost bookends can take a variety of different um, forms um, where we may be trying to build more, but then we're also trying to 
uh, support and preserve the sustainability of residents um, to be able to continue to compete in that environment and that economy as it changes. Um, and there's a variety of different things, but some of them can look like even improvements to income streams, worker protections, um, wage theft protections in, in Denver, um, policy outreach and support that's culturally inclusive, responsive, appropriate. It, it cannot be one size fits all. Um, it's often tailoring. Um, tools for staying in place, uh, community land trust, which I think we're gonna hear about. Um, but some of this is also inclusive of um, uh, almost circuit breakers. And we're starting to learn a little bit more about what those can look like where you're tying um, property taxes or costs to actual income. Um, and some of this is even changing the way that we, um, uh, we think about who qualifies for what um, based on what, it can, what income standard. And right now we use kind of a regional area median income as opposed to what can this neighborhood afford. Um, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're living in this particular area versus another part of the city that's doing well, um, you're not talking about um, real solutions that, uh, that are within reach. Um, and how do you retain what you have? Um, we're looking at overlays um, and even reducing um, parcel sizes. Um, we're looking at uh, making it more difficult to bundle foreclosures. Um, I don't think it can go unnoticed that in uh, West Denver um, and Southwest Denver, the, for the uh, recession uh, of 2008 really did um, lay some significant groundwork for why we're so vulnerable right now. Um, and uh, the fact that uh, we were the fourth, we have the fourth uh, zip code in the country in 2008 of for foreclosures, those properties were um, gobbled up cheap, super cheap, like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 back then um, that are now selling for $300,000. So it is, it was that in addition to all of these other kind of economic vulnerabilities. Um, Renee, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll end there so we can get through, but if there's more, I can add more. Well, that is a good hand up then like to, to Laura then, like given those realities on the ground and that history, Laura, how, yep. how does planning, how do you see the plan, planning department's role in balancing market and development pressure with the needs of to keep affordability for the people who've lived in these neighborhoods for decades? Yeah, and I think that's where uh, community planning development, the CPD in, in the city really plays this role between um, the, the private sector, which is the market, uh, which is out there and just trying to respond to real estate uh, as with, along with, um, you know, against or hopefully it, with some kind of um, dance um, with the community and what those community needs are. Um, and, and that, so, so I think for the planning department, um, w one of the most important things that we have done is for the first time uh, in our history of the city of Denver, we passed uh, our land use plan last year called Blueprint Denver that specifically addresses socioeconomic factors like vulnerability to displacement, access to opportunity um, and diversity of housing options in a neighborhood. So for the first time, we're starting to look at the future of our city and not just look at economic development or education, but say, hey, what happens in these neighborhoods um, from a gentrification standpoint, to your point about its definition, um, needs to be considered in the decisions we make as a city. And so um, we, so for example, 25 years ago, we made a lot of plans about uh, calling just for housing development, in particular for downtown or close to downtown. And we were really successful at that, but we completely uh, missed the market mark on um, that we did not say we want the range of housing. And so now we are saying in our planning efforts, uh, and it should be, you know, I'm, I'm sure in listening to the community in West area, we're, we are reflecting that it should be a range of housing, right? And we should be able to do things, support the community um, as, it, as it responds and interacts with the private sector market um, so that people can stay in their homes if they desire. So how do we support those efforts 
um, that are that the uh, nonprofit uh, community is aiding in or um, so so just trying to be uh, cognizant that there is a thing that needs to happen um, to keep community um, whole uh, you know whole uh, and that we want to help uh, implement the policy to to do that so I'll, I'll leave it there I know we're um, we're running just a little bit short on time so okay great thank you Laura that's helpful so the next question I have for the panel is there's a difference between equity and equality. Sometimes it's a little hard to sort those out, but how do we integrate equity and ways to mitigate displacement into redevelopment and into housing policy? Um, I'm gonna launch that to Tiana. Thank you, Renee. Um, I think for me, uh, an overarching theme is a little bit, uh, sorry about my voice, I think it's allergies, but a little bit of the um, conversation needs to start with maybe not talking about balance so much and talking about undoing the systemic structures that were put in place that made it imbalanced. So when we, we have, we create like a false dichotomy by saying, how do you balance one uh, group's interests with another groups that has had all of the advantages um, throughout history. Um, so when I think of equity, I'm really thinking of um, identifying the issues and making laser focused strategies to address it. Um, because I really feel like equity is rooted in meeting people where they are and figuring out the barriers to their success and implementing ways around those barriers. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't quickly mention one of the ways that folks have been talking about um, creating more equity in housing policy is by implementing and investing in non-traditional structures like community land trusts. Um, just as Councilwoman Torres mentioned, uh, we, we traditionally think of housing as a commodity, um, something that you possess and it gains wealth um, and then you leave it and you go on and you never think about who comes after you. Um, community land trusts provide a way to where the, where the value of the home is not only rooted in what your home is valued at, but it's rooted in taking part in building your wealth and in building, um, uh, <laughs> in building uh, the, well, for those who come after you. Um, and it came out of, um, you know, really quickly just to sum it up, it came out of African Americans being shut out of home ownership and thus actually being shut out of being able to vote. Um, and because at that time they tied home ownership to whether or not you had the right to vote. Um, and actually, in some ways, they still do today. So um, I think that's the lesson for us with this um, is that if the system doesn't work for you, stop trying to only work within the system to make it work. Do something that works for you and others like you um, that actually gives you what you're seeking. Um, so when I think about all of, when I think about equity and I think about how do we integrate it, I think we have to move away from uh, pretending that there was a level playing field and instead we realign ourselves into recognizing that we actually need to overcorrect to actually make it an equitable system. Great. Thank you, Tiana. Um, Councilwoman Torres, Laura, do you want to add on to that? Um, I'll uh, add uh, just, okay, just a, um, a quick bit. Um, there, there was an effort, um, two years ago, just as I was, um, before I left this, um, my city department, um, to come over to city council, uh, but to embed, um, uh, and really start to change city employee and city department culture. Um, so it was not just about kind of, um, uh, kind of depending on um, both 
activism and um, uh, uh, policy changes, but also, also start to uh, put into place different layers of expectation when it came to how does the city invest? How does the city make budget decisions? Um, what's the training behind um, the way we make um, even efficiency recommendations in the city? Um, and so developing the framework for what is um, now the Office of Social Equity and Innovation um, became one of the ways of embedding um, both systems and training around um, uh, equity and racial equality um, into city city department decision making. Um, and while it's new, last year was the first year we started to see that into city department budget uh, requests and budget decisions. It is growing and it's becoming one of those things where there's this triangulation of you, you, you can recognize there's some of it happening internal, there's some of it happening external, there's some of it happening from electeds, um, and it requires all of that in order to start to see things shift a little bit, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's been through intensive work and, um, you know, and when we started that it, it, it became so much more um, uh, raw how badly the city needed it. Um, and uh, to Tiana's excellent point about the need for overcorrecting to, um, to replace the things that, um, uh, that started these systems in, in the first place. We are not, not, not even um, limited to redlining. We also exist in um, areas of, of Denver where by covenant, you were only allowed to sell to another white person. Um, and that existed throughout Denver. And so that just doesn't go away in a generation. Um, and, and being able to um, uh, force the conversation of others entering into communities where they weren't before, um, I'm finding is really a difficult conversation in Denver. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think you hit a really good point on um, to, to be persistent about this, to be equity is something um, I was trying to think of the right metaphor and maybe I, someone in my panel will, but it's, it's, it's just kind of like just always trying to be organized, always trying to be equitable takes persistence. You know, just today I was looking at one of our programs with the eye of equity. Is this accessible? Is everybody who par participates have, um, you know, equitable opportunity to benefit? you know, and found some places where that wasn't true. Like it takes persistence and there is no fault in finding flaws if we continue to look to, you know, to achieve equity because it is something that's just ongoing. Um, is there, is yeah, there anyone else that wants to add? We have a few more minutes on that. You wanna to add to that, yeah. Laura? That would be great. So so just concurrence with, with all the comments before. I, I kind of think of it as a paradigm shift um, and that, that we have just trained in these old tapes of how we do things, e either how we run organizations or run our families or run business. Um, and, and as planners, right, we have been trained to do it a certain way, right? And I'm like, I've been out of school a long time. And so to, um, I have to consciously, to your point, Renee, like, uh, as, as I think we, as a planning department, ask our, you know, try to remind ourselves and remind each other every day, you know, as we, uh, whether we're at the beginning, middle or end of a project or pro planning process, you know, what is that equity lens? Um, and, and I think the city has done a tremendous job in terms of having, having um, that office of social equity and innovation, just touch base with us on a regular basis, whether it's the budget um, whether it's our annual work program, whether it's instituting, um, you know, equity into our strategic plan for each of our departments. So, but, but I just, I want to come back to, you know, physical neighborhoods and place, because that's, that's where I love to, where my head normally goes. Um, and, and just as it pertains to the West Area Plan, some of the things that we are trying to do differently to the point of, of um, shifting our, our thinking a little bit. And, and again, I don't, this is uh, a step, right? And we're hopefully we're moving in the right direction and, and um, we are dependent on the community to lead us um, and to remind us uh, of where, where we're getting it right and where we need to, to continue to work on. And 
some of the things we're doing is just taking a step back and looking at some of those historic injustices, particular to the neighborhoods in West area, having those, those uncomfortable conversations and, and letting that be okay, right? Like that's, the, that's probably one of the hardest things is just to acknowledge and be uncomfortable. Uh, and then asking a lot of questions to understand what, what mattered. So what were those things that happened, whether it's um, highways and arterial roads that split neighborhoods, um, whether it's getting cut off from the gulches uh, and the waterways that families used to be able to connect to. Um, so, how, so understanding that history and that context hopefully helps us try to begin to set policy to peel some of that back. Um, but I think we all, we have to be cognizant that we are leading on the side and always asking the community to have that, where's the direction you wanna go? And we have some ideas about what's important um, and the fact that we are gonna continue to grow as a city and um, how transit and land use need to be connected. Um, and, and we have some tools about the ranges of, of housing options that, that could be, uh, that could come into a community. Um, but it's, but I think we're really trying to acknowledge and hear the, the community's history, um, both culturally and physically, uh, as well as um, think about how to put those pieces back in place that were, have been removed through um, inequities. Cheers to that. Good. That's great. Um, one more question for the panel. Um, we've talked a lot about West Denver, Denver, but many areas in the U.S. are struggling with the same issues that we are or have already been down this road. Um, what are the national lessons and critical factors that are relevant to West Denver and Denver in mitigating the impacts of gentrification? Um, and we'll go to Carrie and then Katie. Um, so you know, when we think about displacement, we really have to think about those the place where it's happening and recognize that it's, as Laura was just talking about, it's socially, it's social, cultural, physical, and economic displacement. So I've pulled some different examples from around the country that are um, pertinent to the issues going on in West Denver and try to address those different types of displacement. The other thing to recognize is that we have to work at every systems level for um, anti-displacement measures from the micro level, the individual and the family to the meso where you have neighborhoods and community groups and the city council to the macro. So our region, our region, Denver and their, its housing market and economy has a lot of pressure on, on West Denver all the way up to the national. So to start with this um, community planning and development, I think one thing that would be helpful is to add some additional indicators to their gentrification measures specifically from the school district what are, what are the enrollments at the local schools? How many children live and go to the school in their neighborhood? And has that changed drastically recently because families have been pushed out? And so the, the children had to choose new schools. How many children in the schools are homeless? So that's information that's real time. It's more current than the census. It's very micro. And I think it could inform the, um, the planning processes better than older census data. Um, the planning department has to continue to work to build trust like through this forum today and in other ways. And one way um, to help with that is to make sure um, a variety of residents are on their steering committee. And so some communities across the country are paying people for their time to participate in um, the more time intensive aspect of community involvement uh, to be a steering committee on, one, on the West Area Plan. Scenario planning is growing a lot across the country where you um, you run analysis on the planning ideas to see what might this do to development in this neighborhood if we adopt this type of zoning or we, um, we, um, we pursue these visions that were identified. What kinds of development would happen? What would be the intensity of it? What if we have another economic crash? Then what would happen? What if we have an economic boom? What if uh, the pandemic goes on longer? So playing out those plans, those 20 year plans in different scenarios to see what would actually happen on the ground. Um, something that the Denver Shared Spaces Group, which is now part of Radian was doing for a while is trying to educate developers who are building mixed use development or new commercial properties on how to design those spaces for nonprofits um, so that, or small local businesses so that 
small groups can afford those spaces and not just big retailers, national franchises. Um, a key thing I think the city council could do is to enact a rental registration program like they have in Boulder and Raleigh, um, North Carolina. And so that requires anybody who's renting a property to pay, pay a small fee and register themselves as a landlord with the city. This would provide, like the school data, a much more real-time, detailed level data about where are all the rental properties and um, uh, who are their owners. Are they local? Are they out of town? Are they mega renter companies or the local um, person who's bought an extra property for income? Tied to that, um, and maybe uh, Renee, you could note if West Denver Renaissance Collaborative is already doing this, but many are starting to um, recommend that we organize people who are renting single family homes in communities. By organizing them, they can then alert the city or local nonprofits if they are being evicted, if they are paying, if they're experiencing large rent increases, and if the landlords are doing maintenance. Um, I looked at the data that the city provides for these neighborhoods, and there is a growing share of single family homes that are being bought by, for cash and by out of state landlords. And we can't always get information from those owners, but we can get information from the renters. Um, and so that could be a, a strong coalition that could help us to inform at the neighborhood level what's going on with these single family properties. Um, there's also a number of state policies that we need to continue to advocate for, more renter protections, better inclusionary zoning laws, a real estate transfer tax, a rental conversion fee. Um, and then I know we wanted a lot more time for community questions, so I'll just do, ask, uh, mention two others. I think we have to work at the regional level. Denver's participation in the Regional Council of Government, Dr. Cog. Um, work with the other cities who also have diverse populations and a wider range of incomes to push the rest of the cities to develop a regional affordable housing plan. We've seen in the last few years more cities get strict on density and not wanting affordable housing in their communities, even moderately priced housing, and then that puts more pressure on Denver and places like West Denver when the rest of the region is not um, accommodating all households and all income levels. Um, and then my, my last point tied to the schools is I think we need to recruit more teachers and principals to participate in the steering committees and planning process. Like the data that schools can provide us, they also provide those firsthand anecdotes of what's going on in their schools and with the children and the families that they interact with on a daily basis. Yeah, Carrie, those are excellent. I think that schools are failing and grappling with displacement and housing affordability in the city and they're in the game and they're a partner to be had for sure and knowing who our landlords are boy it sure would be helpful to be able to communicate them with a time in a time like this with COVID where we really needed to share policy current policy that was changing on a week-to-week -week basis. Um, Katie, I'm going to have you hold and, and I'm sure we'll go to you for some of the first few questions, if that's okay, so we can make sure um, the community has adequate time. Because um, on my clock, we're, it's time for us to go to that. Great. Thank you so much, Renee, and, and uh, this great panel. Um, I've taken a ton of notes. Uh, so as we think about the work that we do in planning, how to incorporate some of this great feedback. Um, we are going to transition to questions from the community. Uh, so uh, those of you who are joining us through some sort of electronic device, you hopefully will see the Q&A at the bottom of the screen where you can enter a question. Many of you have already entered questions and uh, our staff is going through those and we're looking for some common themes so that we can ask a, a person to represent that question that many of you have. Um, we do have our very first person who I'm going to uh, notify here in just a second. Um, but just as a quick reminder, um, definitely make sure that your questions are uh, constructed in a way that it's going to be helpful and positive to getting real solutions. I'm not asking for easy questions. I'm just asking for everyone's uh, respect uh, in communicating with this panel. Um, so thank you for those the, the great questions that we've seen. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask Dina Larson, 
Um, I'm ready to promote you, Dina. I'm going to uh, turn you on, if you will, so that you can ask your question yourself. And just ask everyone to um, be a little bit patient with me while I uh, navigate uh, the software here. So, Dina, I believe you are now um, able to ask your question. So if you want to turn on your mic and or your camera. Do we have Dina? Oh, I see you, Dina. Hold on one second. I'm going to ask you to She's unmute. unmute. All right, I'm going to unmute you, Dina. Hopefully you got that message. And, and just thanks everyone while we sort this all out. So Dina, you should be able to unmute yourself to ask your question. All right. Why don't we uh, go to the next person while we sort out Dina's uh, ability to unmute. Uh, and I think that will be Alicia Bach. So Alicia, I'm gonna look for you here. So give me a second. And I've seen some of your questions, so they look really great. So uh, there, uh, Alicia, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, this is Alicia, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hi, okay, Alicia. sorry for the back, hello. Sorry for the background noise, if you could hear it. Um, I'm a place where they are playing music in the background. Um, so mm -hmm. um, a lot of the great conversation going on today, and I definitely thank you all for showing up and making this happen. It is important. Um, one of my main questions here is, you know, I currently live in the West Denver, Lincoln Park neighborhood, and I know there's been so different projects that have already kind of started, for example, the Lint Sunken Gardens Park. Um, there's also been some infrastructure as far as bike lanes, protected lanes, uh, walking paths, things like that. And then also the Santa Fe project that's going on with the widening of the streets. Um, and so I know that the community or the sea planners specifically have put out a variety of different surveys for, the, for my neighborhood specifically and put different signs in the park, you know, to be a part of the conversation. And I reached out, I've taken those surveys and I've reached out for the West Denver plan, city planners and some of those other more specific projects that I mentioned just a minute ago. And I, as well as my fiance, Britt, she's also um, participated in that and done it on her own and reached out and we have not, you know, gotten any feedback. We haven't gotten a response. I did get, that's why I did get one response saying that a lady was out of town um, but then I never, it's been a month or so since then, and I've never got um, anything since then. So for somebody that is actively trying to be involved and participate and, you know, looking at the city website, also a residential planner um, and involved in this type of thing, and I'm not getting a response, how are we making those connections to folks that aren't actively looking, but are directly impacted by these plans. Um, and then of course, how do I get in touch with somebody to be a part of the conversation uh, in, in more than just this webinar? Thanks. Yeah, well that, that sounds I could like jump a question. In. Yo, you wanna start <laughs> Councilwoman Torres and I'll, I'll follow I, up. I could start with a couple, perfect. Um, thank you, Alicia. Uh, thanks for um, joining in those questions. Um, one, one that may be um, an answer, Lama Link Park isn't part of West Area Plan um, neighborhood area. So uh, that might be one of the reasons why you might not have gotten, um, although there should be some communication back. I know if, if you sign up for the updates from um, that plan, uh, Jean, like we get the, the regular updates. Sunken's master park is just uh, master plan is just starting for that park plan. Um, I, I get what you're asking though, like how how are other folks they get involved if um, if you're not getting kind of some communication back? Um, our office is doing a lot of diverse engagement, so some we've been increasing the number of mailers that we do to neighborhood neighborhoods um, uh, throughout the district with a variety of different recent updates. Um, we're trying to diversify a lot of the ways that we get information out, include 
um, English and Spanish uh, outlets um, and, and radio and podcast. Uh, some of those are the ways that uh, we're able to, to, to get a bit more active. Um, COVID has certainly become a limit, limiting factor for us in terms of getting door to door and bringing community together. But um, appreciate the question and willing to really look at any other suggestions um, and anything we may have missed. Um, even if it's another city department, if you haven't heard back on something you're expecting to hear back on, we'd love to hear from you so we can figure that out. Hey, uh, I'll just add in, Alicia, good, good to see, uh, hear you. I can't see you, but uh, it's been a while since we last saw each other. But um, I, you know, I would say just as part of the planning process, there might be times where we're just taking in um, data from the community. And so it, we might just be in that gathering phase. And it sounds like there's a couple points that you've interacted and haven't heard back. Um, so we'll look into that, but um, there are periods of time where we uh, are like, just kind of have the top of the funnel and just gathering all the data in, then we've got to sort through it. I know on East, uh, East, plan East Area Plan and East Central, sometimes we get like 500, con you know, just a huge volume. Uh, so it's always something we can, we can, uh, you know, work on and, um, you know, as Councilwoman Torres said, just always looking for new ways to, to access the community. And, awesome. and you can always, um, if I can just add in, if you're interested in serving on any of those steering committees or panels, we're happy to um, have you reach out to WDRC and advocate on, on your behalf to be on some of those steering committees for those projects. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you. So I, I would like to see if Dina, um, if you are able to unmute yourself and, and ask your question. And if uh, after Dina, I uh, would love to introduce Andrea Loud. Uh, Andrea is from the Villa Park neighborhood uh, and is a great advocate for her community and uh, would love to promote her uh, to ask her question. Dina, are you able to join us? I still see you, but uh, not seeing your ability to unmute. So we may come back to you or Dina, if you'd like to enter your question in the chat, then we can ask it on your behalf. So, um, Andrea, if you are there, if you can unmute yourself, it would be great to hear your question. Andrea Loud. Okay. Uh, cannot unmute. Oh, shoot. Um, uh, let's see. I'm going to try one more thing and see if that uh, allows you to talk. Uh, give it a shot now, Andrea. See if that works for you. No matter how much you guys, we practice. Got <laughs> I got it. Great. Got it. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask this question. And I'm only asking this question because I'm on several committees and everyone have always asked me to describe equity. And I have to answer for my community. I don't know what it is. I, how can I describe what I don't see? And I tell you, and I and then my answer goes this way, and it's got it's a very bold, hard answer, and it may make some people uncomfortable, but hey, we'll, we'll work around it. But the, when they ask me that, here's, I tell them the best way I see equity is you have these people at this fence, and I'm talking from my eyes, you have people at this fence, white, uh, there's a white person, there's non-black, non-white non, um, uh, person, and then you have a black person. The white person gets the brick and the fence is lowered by a foot. The non-white, non-black person gets the, the fence lowered and it's only half a foot. The black person, the fence is not lowered at all. The white person get the brick box. The non-white, non-black get the wood box. The blacks get wet cardboard boxes. So I am asking, my question was, where's the equity here in Villa Park, where I live? I live 
um, um, west of Tennyson and um, east of Sheridan, and I'm south of Colfax, and I'm north of Sixth Avenue. And that's my question. Where's the equity for this neighborhood, even with the housing and the gentrification? So when I'm asked that question again, perhaps I'm able to give a better answer. Great, thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Hi, Andrea, it's uh, Jamie Torres. I appreciate your question. Um, just wanna uh, chime in. It's I, I know exactly what visual you're talking about and um, uh, the experience that uh, you laid out is it is exactly, I think, one of the things that's used um, as um, the descriptor. What does it feel like when you don't have um, access, when there, there, there isn't kind of um, equal or equal opportunity to, um, to participate or to, um, uh, to move up economically, to have that mobility? Um, one of the ways that I also look at it, particularly when it comes to Villa Park in West Denver, is um, it's a representation of privilege, and um, and and one of the one of the things that's true of privilege is that um, depending on the on the context, you may have it and others may not, and others may have it when you don't, and it depends on I think the circumstance. Sometimes when I was in my prior role running the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, um, those who were monolingual Spanish speakers. Um, were at a severe disadvantage when it came to receiving city information mm -hmm. and um, having information translated and interpreters provided for events um, and really trying to overcome this for West Denver has become a, an, an issue of equity. So it, 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 there, there are circumstances where we find this is a fight for equity because our community does not have it right now. There are other circumstances when we're talking about a much larger context of um, national equity or regional or your own experience where that's very real. And so what you're describing, um, I think is gonna have um, uh, its own context and where I might experience it might have a slightly different context, um, but it makes each of those valid because they are, um, they are battles for something that uh, you should have in terms of access um, and others should have in terms of access. And I don't know if I'm, I'm describing things more, more muddy now, but um, uh, fights for equity become contextual and are about kind of what that individual experience is like and um, the kinds of barriers that are in the way there. So it is getting deeper into here's where I've experienced it and here's where I've been fighting for it. Um, and I hope that we can do that um, for Villa Park together. It's the neighborhood I've grown up in myself as well. Thank you, Councilman Torres. And thank you, Aunt Andrea. It's a good question. There are questions we're addressing and we're beginning to acknowledge that the fixes, those different, that scenario that you describe, it's different to fix a wet cardboard box than it is to fix um, other needs. And in some cases, it's different solutions for different needs. And we're not always comfortable with that but we're working to a place where, it, where we're acknowledging that sometimes different solutions are needed and those are the right, the right steps. Awesome. Next question. It, yeah, I we have, oh, go ahead, Laura. Just really briefly, I think the other thing I um, am thoughtful about is that this is a long process um, for, the, for the hundreds of years of, of systemic racism that we have had in this country and the hundred and however many years we have had here in Colorado and in Denver, um, we, we have to, it will, it is a long um, row for us to plow. Um, and I think we just have to take it, you know, for what we can see in front of us, what, what do we see today uh, in Villa Park um, that needs to be addressed? And I think it will continue to evolve and there will be new things that rise that we're perhaps not conscious about now or um, hasn't risen up. And it's, I, I just think this is going to be a long process, but I, I think you know, the, the, certainly the folks around us here are committed to um, that, that acknowledgement and, and trying to fix it. 
slowly but surely. Hey, thank okay, you for thank that. Thank you, Laura. We're going to. Yeah, I think. Hi, yeah, Jaime uh, Aguilar, I think you should have the ability to unmute yourself to ask your question. And then we have a question related to community land trusts that uh, has come up in the chat. So after Jaime, if you are able to unmute yourself, uh, here we go. Sorry, I had to quick. Um, some ideas behind the equity and community land trust. Um, I just wanted to ask about or had questions about like, you know, how do we benefit the current home or property owners, you know, to have buy-in and, and into like this land trust piece. Like I know it was mentioned and I really took attention to it because it's relation to the equity discussion. And um, I thought we'd hear more about it. So, but um, forgive me if I misunderstand the benefit of a land trust concept, but um, I like the idea. Yeah, I, I can take that one. Um, so, um, Jaime, I think that um, the leaders of West Denver um, in 2017, we considered tools and the land trust concept was put on the wall. And um, for, for other reasons, other projects that were easier to pursue, it was kind of tabled, but it was still out there as to the benefit it, that it could have. Um, the partnership that's formed now um, <clears throat> is very unique in that when it first came up for West Denver, I described, well, you know, there's a lot of housing, there's a lot of houses on the market and investors are only buying them. So the number of displaced that we've seen 70% was caused by a real estate transaction by an investor. Renee froze. I think Renee froze. So Tiana, if you are with us, can you chime in on that question as well related to community land trusts? Sure, absolutely. So um, just as a reminder for anyone, I work for Elevation Community Land Trust. And uh, the piece that Renee was starting to talk about um, was creating a land trust. We've partnered with WDRC to use our land trust in a different way. So typically to answer your question, land trusts, um, the way we work is that we, uh, the way our model works is that we purchase homes, uh, market rate homes uh, across Colorado. Um, and we partner with um, municipal governments to help bring the cost of those homes down so that they are affordable. So for instance, we buy a home that's 300,000 we, uh, we put in 50,000, we ask our partners to put in 50,000 to make that home now 200,000 because our target is uh, to be able to sell, sell these homes um, for folks making between you know, 60 and 80% area median income, um, which is different for every city but I think, and I always get nervous when I start guessing, but I think for Denver, that's around, that's between 40 and $80,000 a year. Um, so- I cannot we, find the link now because we, it was never in our calendar. I think Renee, you're back in case you can hear me. I'm a- I can I hear just you. A question. Um, yeah. I'm just talking about how community land trusts work and I'll let you, uh, continue with what you were saying, but I'm just giving that overall overview. Um, yeah. So what we're doing is, uh, so that's, so in exchange for um, getting an yeah. affordable for sale home, you, we take the land uh, out of the equation. So, and that also helps keep the home permanently affordable. So elevation is a steward of the land and you, the homeowner, uh, still own the home, you can do whatever you like to it. I mean, don't destroy it, but you can do anything a regular homeowner can do. Um, and when you go to sell it, uh, you sell, you, you resale for, um, you get less equity out of the home than if you owned both the land and the improvements. 
um, but you're actually keeping it affordable for those who come after you. So that target price of uh, being affordable between 40 and um, $80,000 a year, that's meant not only for you, but for those who come after you. Um, so when I spoke earlier about thinking about our home as not only a wealth tool, but as um, infrastructure, as a public commodity, as decommodifying uh, housing, that's what I mean that that's what the land trust does. So um, you, still you still get equity, you still uh, go on and become a homeowner. I um, mean, many of our homeowners, many homeowners in CLTs become market rate um, homeowners once they leave the CLT model. But what you're also leaving behind is the ability for families and you're similarly situated as you to be able to access affordable for sale housing options. So that's a really quick and dirty, <laughs> feel free to reach out to me and I can uh, definitely get into the nitty gritty of it. Um, but that is what I meant when I said kind of upending the way we talk about housing, thinking about housing as equity, as rooted in equity. Um, that's what the CLT model is um, intended to do. So Renee, Wonderful. Thanks. thanks, Tiana. Sure. And I, think, I would just add it, it, the many owners are in the dilemma that they have to sell their home or go into debt to leverage their equity. And this provides an option to that. It allows a homeowner to take that home equity to stabilize their situation in place. It's not for everyone, but it's a good solution. Great, thank you both. Um, Caleb Susuras, I believe. If you are with us, I think you have the ability to ask your question. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Caleb. Um, I live in, actually, I live in East Denver, um, so I'll make this short, but I am a social worker and I work with a lot of individuals in um, West Denver. And I believe one of the panelists mentioned the need for sort of a, or the priority um, for a range of housing um, in the housing stock. Um, so maybe from low to high income. Um, and a lot of the individuals that I talk to on a daily basis express, you know, some real difficulty getting um, affordable housing. And I believe there's like a three to five year wait list for most affordable housing in the region. And so I was kind of wondering what is the, the idea of wanting a, um, a spectrum of housing stock? I think that was me. He might have uh, mentioned, talked about the range of housing. And so I think what we're looking at is how, how do we, um, there's a lot of neighborhoods that just have a singular type of housing. Uh, if you're from East Denver, you, you know, you might think about some of the neighborhoods in the Southwest, um, even some of the neighborhoods, you know, Congress Park is a pretty consistent type of housing. Um, and so it, um, that economic range is um, pretty limited within, within that area. But if we think about uh, one of the things we talk about in Blueprint Denver is um, a complete neighborhood. So if you think about how could the how could a range of people who do all sorts of different jobs be able to live in a in a complete neighborhood, right? So that we have whether it's senior housing uh, for affordable housing, whether it's ADUs that Renee is working on in West Denver. Um, whether it's, you know, looking at more transitional housing and the 30% of the area meeting income, moving up to the 60% where you start getting federal funding for housing, uh, you start providing for, for families uh, more in that range, and then workforce housing, which is kind of at that 80% of the area meeting income, but to really try to hit each of those tiers um, of people's income so that it, it's... Um, one of the things I find is that the more uh, diversity you have amongst the people you live with, the more tolerable and the more understanding you have of their perspectives. And you might understand um, the wet cardboard box a little bit better uh, if you've always been standing on um, a wood box or a brick box. And so uh, I, I think it is the goal of, of the planning department to try to enrich in um, the diversity of housing, that range of housing, and, and thereby um, 
the different types of neighbors that we'll have. Uh, so that, that, is, that, that was the point, I think, behind that. Super. Can I so turn in on that to... real quick? Yeah, I was going to say, Katie, I didn't know if uh, Katie wanted to add anything to that, yeah. given her work with uh, Enterprise. And then our next speaker will be Zutan. Sure, and Councilwoman Torres, if you want to chime in as well, feel free. Only, only that as aspirational as that is, it's so hard. Um, and what, what we've seen and what I've seen anyway, anecdotally in West Denver are folks who end up buying here because they can't afford a property in the neighborhood that they prefer to be in. And, and, and that's one of the cultural gentrification pieces that, that becomes really um, harmful, I think, to a community like West Denver that is, that is rich culturally where you have folks who don't really wanna be there um, and, and, and there's, there's not as much value or appreciation for what exists or the history there um, because it's so much more expensive to buy property in other parts of the city and, um, and breaking through some of that, that difficulty. Um, I, I think we're, we're, we're seeing it now with the group living zoning changes that are happening right now. Um, where folks are really resistant to living next to folks that they've never lived next to before. Yeah, I totally agree with that, Councilwoman Torres. And I think um, it makes sense to talk just a little bit about zoning because that's what uh, I know so many of you are working on the, are involved in the neighborhood planning process. Um, and I really feel like in order to address involuntary displacement that we really have to face exclusionary zoning head on. Um, so we don't have redlining maps anymore, but we do have our zoning codes and these codes determine um, what can be built where and it plays a really big role in segregation and housing affordability. And so on a citywide level, we need to have land use policies that allow a wide variety of housing types that including those that are more affordable. So things like condos, apartments, four plexes, six plexes, eight plexes. Um, and it's critical that we address exclusionary zoning on a citywide level, because if we improve the zoning to allow more housing types in only formerly redlined communities or only in the West Denver neighborhoods, for example, or only in communities of color, we drive the real estate and market investment only to these communities. And we know that that's a contributing factor to involuntary displacement. So in addition to added, allowing more housing types in West Denver, we also need to allow more housing types in primarily single family neighborhoods or primarily white neighborhoods citywide. And that's really important because these are the neighborhoods that often most strongly oppose increasing density. So when I know coming into this as panelists, we got to see some of your questions in advance and a lot of people asked, what are the things that I can do personally to help with this problem? And one of the big things that we can do, all of us as residents of Denver is support uh, increased residential density that allows more housing types in our neighborhoods, but also throughout the city. And some of the other things that we can be thoughtful about are um, other things that allow for more affordable housing in our, in our policies. So things like um, prioritizing uh, affordability and putting roofs over someone's head rather than parking requirements that may make it a little bit easier to park or you can park closer to your house. Um, balancing building design requirements with affordability um, and thinking critically about all of the um, different requirements and, and, and um, codes that we have and how it impacts both how our neighborhood looks and feels, but also creates an environment where we do have more diversity in our communities. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, and Zutan, if you are still with us, uh, we'd love to have your question. Hi, thank you all. Um, so I live in Green Valley Ranch, but I actually am a social work intern who works with children in the Sun Valley neighborhood. And many of those families have been displaced. My question is, can someone speak to specific state and local policies currently in place that either support gentrification and displacement or those that actively work as safeguards? I can talk about, um, 
Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I'll, I was. I can talk, uh, Zutan. Thank you for the question. I can speak to just locally what we're doing uh, on a policy level. Um, and as I mentioned early on, you know, I think we have to start with plan. Like, what is the perspective of the city wide? Uh, about that. And so with Blueprint Denver um, and really making that strong statement that we are leading, uh, we want to lead with equity and, and a lens around um, the acknowledging the vulnerability to displacement and that that should guide, uh, right? So we start at the citywide of a Blueprint, uh, Blueprint Denver and the comprehensive plan. The next level down is something like the West Area Plan uh, that is um, that is in Councilwoman Torres's district and, and neighborhoods, and so that is taking that message that starts at the citywide and bringing it down to the next level. Um, so, so that's from a planning standpoint, policy. From a regulatory standpoint, in terms of zoning, we um, are undergoing a process, uh, a policy or law process called um, the Affordable Housing Zoning Incentive. Right now, the state, of, the city of Colorado of Denver, is prohibited from putting in place a requirement for affordable housing on rental, uh, and so we are looking at how do we use zoning to incentivize um, affordable housing um, as a um, bon dentist, bonus density, essentially. Um, and so that's that's one of the tools. Um, I think it'd be important if somebody, if a panelist here wants to speak about what the state is looking at, hopefully this next legislative session uh, in regards to the Telluride case. Yeah, I can talk about Yeah, you bet. And thanks so much for this question. I think it's a really important piece of how we um, can address inequities. Um, so some of the things uh, that are happening at the state level are resource-based and I think right now are really important. Um, so access to rent and mortgage assistance. We know that um, job loss and impacts of the pandemic have been felt more in communities of color and lower income neighborhoods. And so making sure that we have adequate uh, rental assistance programs, mortgage assistance programs, and that they're accessible um, so that they practice language justice, that they're available to undocumented neighbors and are um, widely uh, shared through neighborhood networks. Another important uh, consideration that's happening at the state level is around uh, tenant protection. So in Colorado, our balance of power between landlords and tenants is um, strongly favors landlords. And so making sure that we're able to create uh, protections for tenants. So some of the things that we are seeing, um, we had some Good wins last session or the last couple of sessions actually with improvements to warranty of habitability, the require or um, a prohibition of discrimination based on source of income, which allows more people to use housing vouchers and other sources of income to qualify for housing. And um, efforts are coming in the next session to focus on predatory late fees and the impact that that can have on housing affordability. And then um, to answer Laura's question about uh, Telluride. So Telluride is kind of shorthand that uh, people use for um, the court decision that in Colorado has made it so that we cannot have rent control in Colorado. Um, it's a really politically divisive uh, conversation in our state, as you might imagine. Um, so from what I know, I don't know of an effort to specifically overturn the Telluride decision. But what I do know is that um, Senator Lantin and others are pursuing an effort to allow jurisdictions to um, to have inclusionary zoning. And so the difference would be, uh, it wouldn't allow rent control, but it would allow a city like Denver to say, we want not only to incentivize affordable housing, but we actually want to require affordable housing as part of our permit permitting process. Great. Thank you, Katie. We Renee, have one last question, I believe. Um, Renee, given can I add to that frame. really quickly before you before you move on? Sure. Um, one, one thing that I would mention in terms of um, uh, policies or circumstances that support gentrification, um, uh, 
at least from my opinion and others may um, disagree, but um, zoning entitlement uh, is, is um, could be a big deal there. We've got a lot of areas throughout district three where there is greater entitlement than what exists there right now, which, which at, at least for a city council person, it means something can go up there that's much bigger than what's there right now. And there, there is no pass through city council. Um, one of the benefits that's been built up has been the inclusion of equity in the plans that are associated with the city. Um, so that has given us a tool to go back um, because everything has to have support from plans, whether it's a neighborhood plan or the city's blueprint plan or whatever it might be. Um, uh, that gives us a tool to go back and say, we don't feel like this has achieved that particular marker. Um, and that is a criteria that, that I've got to rely on. Um, it's the only thing that I can rely on to approve or deny a, a, a zoning um, application. Um, but it is one of those things that's now in it that wasn't there before, which I think is really great. Um, and, uh, and the rental registry is coming to Denver. It's, it's council is on it, especially your council person um, for the, the speaker, Councilwoman Gilmore has been building it. And Carrie, I know you were trying to jump in on this. And then I think we're gonna try to take one more call uh, or one more message, question. I'll, just, I'll, I'll add my answer to the chat. And I think it's, it was about DHA and HUD policy and specific to Sun Valley and that redevelopment. That way we can get to the last question. Wonderful, thank you Thanks, very Carrie. much. So I think there was a question in the chat in Spanish um, and I believe uh, uh, either Laura or Councilwoman Torres, if either of you would uh, see if you could find that question and maybe ask it on behalf of the guests. I just saw it come in. Uh, it, it is, it's similar to what we um, uh, were just talking about with Tellurites. The question is, um, um, are you working on any project, uh, any legal project that would control, um, basically that would control rent, rent um, to a reasonable level? And Katie right. talked about that a bit. I don't know if you Yeah, so to... right now in Colorado, we cannot have rent control because of a court decision. There is a lot of grassroots work happening um, to change that. And part of it is the inclusionary zoning that I just talked about. So I'll put some uh, people that you can connect with in the chat. All right, well, I wanna just uh, thank everyone. We do have a slide, if we can get it up, that uh, talks about um, some available resources. Uh, there are lots of questions that we didn't get a chance to get to this evening. Uh, we will uh, go through those questions and provide answers. We will make those answers available uh, to you. For those of you who registered, we are going to send out resources and responses to the questions that we were unable to get to. So if you signed up, you will get that information emailed to you uh, at the email that you use to register. We will also make sure that information and resources are available through our project website, which I'll show you in just a second. But just to give you a sense of um, really why we really wanted to have this opening to this discussion is really a large part of displacement and how we solve it and how we begin to address it is really by sharing with you all what resources are already available that you just may not be aware of. Um, and really getting the tools and the, pro the programs and the available resources in your hands is really where we'd like to really try to start and connecting people to those resources that are available. So for those of you who can see the screen um, and those who can't, I'll just quickly share with you, we've got a number of housing resources available through our um, host uh, housing, uh, housing opportunity and stability team. Um, the Neighborhood Equity and Stabilization Team is also NEST and is also uh, active and, and very busy helping people and connecting people to resources in West Denver in particular, but really throughout the entire city. So we have a number of uh, resources available on housing. Uh, you can reach those resources um, around affordable home ownership and foreclosure protection and eviction prevention through Denver Gov dot org backslash housing. 
denvergov.org backslash housing. Um, there's a whole host of uh, additional resources related to housing, but that would be a good place to start. Um, we also have other services related to food, cash, medical care, child care that you can reach through our human services. So denvergov.org backslash human services. Um, and also, uh, if you are in a situation where you would like to have some legal advice, we do have uh, resources available uh, at low cost through Colorado Legal Services. That number is 303-837-1313. 303-837-1313. And uh, Colorado Affordable Legal Services is another uh, resource, 303-996-0010, 303-996-0010. Um, there are many other ways to get involved. Uh, one of the best ways to get involved in the West Area planning process, which still has several months in front of it. So if you're just hearing about this planning effort in your neighborhood and would like to get more involved, it is not too late. Uh, and you can reach the project website through denvergov.org backslash West Plan, W-E-S-T-P-L-A-N uh, for your neighborhoods. So um, the last slide here is contact information uh, for myself. Uh, my colleague, Valerie Herrera, who uh, speaks Spanish for anyone in the community who would like to have Spanish language first uh, and information conveyed to them in their native language. Uh, we also have uh, ways for you to reach uh, Renee through the WDRC, uh, her website there, or her email address, uh, her colleague, uh, Megan Miles, and information on the um, pilot program, the uh, accessory dwelling unit pilot program to help people really stay in place and generate um, income to help them do that. Uh, so I would just love to really thank you all, thank our panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules tonight uh, to have this really important question with us. So I just really uh, cannot thank you all enough for your time. Really am excited that the city is really diving deep on these really important topics uh, and just really look forward to working with you all. Um, so with that, thank you so very much and uh, have a great evening. Please be in touch. Um, takes me a little bit, we're really busy, but definitely reach out to me and you will get a response. And also through the council member and her office and all the wonderful people doing work in, in West Denver and Denver as a whole. So thank you very much. Look forward to talking with you all in the future and have a good evening. Thank you. Bye, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Dinner time for my dog. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Couldn't have been a better timed goodbye from your dog. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, Eugene. Thank you. I'm going to end the meeting now, everyone. <laughs>